First and foremost, I want to thank uh, Dr. Donald Wheeler. I don't know if anyone has uh, knows who Dr. Donald Wheeler is, if you've ever heard of that name before. Um, he, I've, I've talked to, to Dr. Wheeler several times about this talk. In fact, the title of the talk is stolen from one, one of his papers, one of his published papers. Um, so if you haven't checked out uh, Dr. Wheeler's work, Highly, highly, highly recommend it. In fact, I'll give you some links um, at the end of the talk. So uh, thank you very much for, uh, for Dr. Wheeler. Now, on to the presentation. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the American author Malcolm Gladwell. Um, I, I, I have to come clean. I'm not a fan. I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not a fan of his. Now, not that I necessarily think he's a bad person or I think the stuff that he does is, is wrong, although we'll talk about some of that here in a second. I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't do anything for me. Um, so... Earlier this year, a friend of mine contacted me and said, you know what, Dan, you really have to listen to this podcast, Revisionist History. I don't know if everybody knows this. Malcolm Gladwell has a podcast called Revisionist History. Um, and there was an episode in particular uh, that was called The Big Man Can't Shoot in uh, June 2016. Right? Big Man Can't Shoot. In that podcast episode, Malcolm Gladwell talks about what he calls, his words, not mine, uh, the greatest game ever played the greatest basketball game ever played. We're gonna, well, we're gonna talk about American sports here. I hope that's okay. Um, although it's kind of an international sport now. Uh, the greatest basketball ever, uh, game ever played, played in Hershey, Pennsylvania in March. Sorry, am I blocking away? In March, 1962, Hershey, Pennsylvania. Does anybody know what Hershey, Pennsylvania is fam actually infamous for? Uh, I don't know if you can call it chocolate. <laughs> when, <laughs> So when I come to the UK, I always pack an empty suitcase. I'm a Cadbury's man myself, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, whiskey and chocolate, not necessarily in that order. Uh, actually, probably in that order. Uh, that's, that's, that's what I take home. I cannot stand Hershey's chocolate. If anyone's ever had it, it's just really bad. They used to play professional basketball games in Hershey, Pennsylvania, or one-off kind of exhibition professional basketball games. In that game... Uh, a, a player by the name of Wilt Chamberlain scored 100 points. So the most points scored in any, number, uh, in any uh, professional game ever. Um, hadn't been done before. Still hasn't been done since. A couple people have come kind of close, like in the 80s. Uh, no, one, no one has matched or exceeded Wilt Chamberlain's effort on that night uh, in March of 1962. Couple things about Will Chamberlain, if you're not familiar with him. In March of 1962, he was considered the most dominant player in the league. He had already won several awards. I think he'd won some MVPs. He'd won Rookie of the Year. I don't know, you don't have the expression rookie over here, do you? First year player. Um, he was the player that most teams feared, right? They did not want to play Will Chamberlain. He was just, you did not want to, you did not want to be on the opposite side of the court of, of, uh, of this guy. But he did have one knock against him. And that is, he was widely known as a terrible, terrible free throw shooter. Awful. Just awful. If anybody familiar with Shaquille O'Neal, kind of similar, similar type thing. Um, that night in Hershey, Pennsylvania, however, according to Malcolm Gladwell, He's an excellent free throw shooter. And the evidence that Malcolm Gladwell gives for his uh, free throw shooting, for Wilt's free throw shooting performance is Wilt Chamberlain's career free throw percentage rate is 51%. Over the course of his career, the, the, that, that is what he, he shoots. Half the times he makes it, half the times he doesn't, right? On that 100-point game, he shot 87.5%. And this is what Malcolm Gladwell says. This is the reason why... Um, this was the greatest game ever played. Somebody, by the way, somebody please take a note. I'll probably remember, but somebody please take a note. I, I want to come back to this, this exact comparison. There's a, there's a problem with this particular comparison. Um, somebody remind me. Like any good story, there's a twist, right? Most people know, if you've watched basketball, the, the, the shooting motion that you use when you're shooting free throws is to use an overhand motion. That's how 99% of basketball players shoot free throws, right? That's how, that's how they shoot. In 1962, to try and fix how bad he was at shooting free throws, Wilt Chamberlain actually switched to an underhand motion. In America, the pejorative for this is called a granny shot. Um, I think that's an offense to grand grandmothers everywhere. Um, but that's, that's, that's what it's called. So he decided, you know what, I'm, I'm a terrible free throw shooter. I'm not going to shoot overhand. Uh, I'm going to shoot underhand. Malcolm Gladwell says that one change, that change, and only that change is what led to the greatest basketball game ever played. But did it? Um, 
Most people probably know this about me if you don't know me. Uh, I, don't, I don't care about people. I only care about data. <laughs> if you want to care about people's feelings, talk to Seth, talk to Julia, talk to uh, Emily. Is it? We haven't met. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> Don't talk to me. I don't care about people. I care about data. So if somebody is going to make an assertion like this was the greatest game ever played and it was because of free throws, I'm going to want to go look at the data. Right? Not quite sure that Malcolm Gladwell did this, but I, I want to. So what I did is I went for 1962 and I plotted, if I can do this, um, I plotted across the bottom just in sequence over time uh, from left to right all the games that Wilt Chamberlain played. Um, and then these dots represent the points that he scored in each game. Pretty obvious to see where that 100-point game is, isn't it? Your eyes kind of drawn to that. Does everybody see, everybody see where that dot is right there? Okay. So that's his points per game, right? This is his points per game. Now I wanted to do the exact same thing for his free throw percentage. Okay. So same plot, all the games from left to right, only now the dots represent his free throw percentage. Still possible to see um, that 100-point game. That's still kind of obvious, maybe not as obvious. But when Dan looked at this data, when Dan first plotted this data, what do you think is the point, the data point that Dan's eye was drawn to? Can anybody guess? What was the data point that Dan was like, what about that one? The lowest one. I'm going to try and do this. Let's see if, it's gonna, if it works. I don't know if it will work. It's not going to work. Uh, oh, uh, oops, free throw shooting, is it going to work? There we go, that one, that one right there. That's just four games prior to his 100-point performance, four games prior, and it's his worst free throw shooting performance of the season. Now, I tried to go look, I uh, tried to go look this up, and I could find absolutely no information whatsoever about that game. Um, in fact, the only, the only way that I knew that it happened is I had to go to some uh, obscure NBA um, stats website to find all of this data. But if you go to look up articles about that particular game, can't find anything. You look up that 100-point game, there's articles. In fact, there, in fact, I'm pretty sure there have even been books written about that 100-point game. Nothing about that game in particular. Um, that seemed kind of strange to me. So, uh, yeah, that was on, on February 24th, 1962. Before we can talk about what's really going on here, right? And before we can talk about some failures of data analysis and why maybe, maybe this, this, this analysis is potentially, or, or Gladwell's analysis is potentially dubious, we have to take a step back uh, and talk about some, some just very, very, very basic facts about data. I know it's the last talk of the day and we're talking about data. I know, I know, I know. I'm going to try and make this interesting. I promise. I don't know if I'm going to work. Um, first thing you should need to know about data is all data have noise. Whatever data set you're collecting, whatever data set you're analyzing, whatever, any data that you can, especially measurement data, and most of what we're going to be talking about today is measurement data, especially measurement data, all data is going to have noise. Any data set you look at, it's all going to have noise. Some data might have signal, though. While all data have noise, some data might have signals, right? So the first, the primary goal of data analysis, then, is to take a look at your data. A data set and see if you can separate signal from noise. That's the first thing we need to do. We know we're going to have a data set dominated by noise. Is there any, any signal in there? So we're going to try and separate out possible signal from probable noise. If we don't do that, if we do not begin with that analysis, we are prone to two mistakes. And if anybody's read any Deming, you know these two mistakes. Uh, the first mistake is to mistake noise for signal. Spoiler alert, that's what, that's what Doug Gladwell was doing. Um, and the second mistake is to mistake signal for noise, of course. None of this is, um, none of this is new, right? None of this is new. In fact, most of what I'm going to be talking about has been around for 100-ish years, um, developed by this gentleman right here. If I put up this picture here, does anybody, anybody know who this is? Yeah, I know you don't. <laughs> Anyone? Nobody? Nobody wants to guess? If I say the name W. Edwards Deming, has anyone heard of Deming? Yeah, everybody's heard of Deming. Nobody's heard of Walter Schuert. Walter Schuert taught Deming everything Deming knows 
pretty much about everything. In fact, if you read Deming, um, you'll see that Deming often quotes Short. Uh, the PDCA cycle that most people call the Deming cycle, Deming always called the Short cycle. Um, the approach to quality control that most people call the Deming approach, Deming called the Short approach. Right? Um, Short taught Deming everything, pretty much everything they needs to know. So uh, everything I'm going to talk about here is is going to be um, is going to be Short's. And, and what Short would say is, if you have a data set, what we need to do is figure out a way that we can draw boundaries around this data data set to be able to separate out that signal from noise. Remember I was saying, that's the first thing we need to do. So is there a way that we can look at this data, maybe do some, some simple calculations to be able to separate out signal from noise? Um, he would, uh, would do that, and, and by the way, uh, I'll, I'll just say this right now. We are not, just so you know, we are not gonna go into the sp uh, specifics uh, of how to draw these boundaries. We're just not gonna do that. It's way, way too much math for, for too late in the day. Um, just trust me as I go through this, the boundaries that I draw are gonna be completely based on, um, on Schwartz's method, right? So he would say, as long as you can draw those boundaries around your data, anything within those boundaries is noise. Probable noise, right? Um, anything outside of those boundaries is possible signal. He would call that stuff that's outside the boundaries um, a, a signable cause. Deming called, him, called it special cause. Don't ask me why. I mean, I do know why, but don't ask me why. Um, a signable cause, special cause, those all mean the same things. Uh, exceptional variation, whatever. Those, those, those all really, really kind of mean the same thing. So Schubert would say, hey, anything outside those boundaries, um, possible signal, anything within those boundaries, probable noise. So the first thing we need to do is to be, in order to understand our data, is to uh, draw those boundaries uh, around there. Most people know that chart as a control chart. Technically, it is a control chart because that's what Schuert called it. Unfortunately, the term control chart has been perverted over the years um, by Six Sigma folks, and I apologize if there are any Six Sigma people um, in the audience. Um, but because it's been perverted, uh, the, the, the name, the kind of in vogue, preferred name right now is a process behavior chart. When you, when you see the term process behavior chart, you know we're talking about Schuert's approach. When you see the term control chart, you're maybe talking about Schuert, you're maybe talking about, maybe not talking about Schuert, if it's JIRA, I don't even know what that thing is that they call a control chart, um, you know, in there. Um, but the idea is simple, like I've said before. Anything that, um, any process that shows assignable cause is considered unpredictable. And from Schwartz's perspective, unpredictable means you can't use your past data as a reliable predictor, as a, as a way to forecast um, future performance, if you have those assignable cause. Because he would say that assignable cause is a signal that something in your process is either changing or has changed. Right? If you don't have any of those things, um, then, your process is predictable. But if you try to make forecasts, and this is where you should have listened to Julia before, if you try to make forecasts on process um, that is unpredictable, you're gonna be in trouble. More importantly though, any process improvement that you do while your process is exhibiting this, exhibiting this assignable cause is premature. Right? You need to do something else. Okay, if your assignable causes have all been eliminated, then what you really need to do in order to improve is to make some type of systemic change. In the case of, of Wilt Chamberlain, what was the systemic change that he made? Going from overhand to underhand. Yeah, he made, he made a fundamental change to how he shot, he shot free throws, all right? This is a, what I'm gonna call a cycle time run chart. It technically is a cycle time run chart. Um, for a scrum team doing two week sprints. Now this is not an indictment of scrum. I'm not saying scrum is bad. I'm not saying scrum is good. I'm saying this was a scrum team that was doing two week sprints and this is the, their cycle time data that they produced. Taking Schuert's method, we're able to draw a boundary um, around this cycle time. Now, cycle time, generally speaking, cycle time and throughput data um, are what, what are called zero bounded time series, um, which means if you, were to if you were to do the Schuert approach, you'll almost always get an upper bound, probably get an upper bound, but you'll almost never get a lower bound. Your lower bound will be zero. 
that's just the nature of because you really can't get lower than zero. Right? That's that's just that's just how it works. Um, so that's why these things will be one bounded. Uh, the upper that upper bound is 65 days. This is a Scrum team doing two week sprints. That upper bound is 65 days. Is this team predictable? Getting a lot of people shaking their heads. Anybody want to say yes? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Believe it or not, this process is predictable. This team has got the exact process that they have designed. Right? This is where Carl would come in. I don't know, what's the name of your talk, Carl? Predictably Agile. This is where Carl would come in and would say, even though this team is predictable, uh, it's not the, the data that they're producing is not very useful, and I would absolutely agree with him. Right? That's oh god, that was on tape, wasn't it? I just said, <laughs> I just said Carl is right. <laughs> um, um, but this this team this team is predictable. Their their data this is this is this is what's called the voice of the process. Their data is saying, hey, whatever process you're doing right now, you should really pretty much expect you know any value between one and sixty five is is reasonable. Anything outside that sixty five, we need to talk about. Um, but management all behaved kind of like you did and say, ah, oh, this team sucks, right? There's, they're not predictable at all, even though they are. If, and this is something, hopefully you picked this up on what, what Julia said too, this process is predictable. If you want to make it better, and what do, you, what do you suppose better would be for, for this team? What they probably think is better, not necessarily though. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Get, to get closer, to get that upper bound to be somewhere around that 14-day mark, that's probably what they'd be looking for. That's going to require some type of systemic change. Um, and by the again, I'm not saying dump Scrum or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying whatever they're doing here, um, their processes, uh, their data is reflecting um, reflecting that. Hopefully, hopefully that makes sense, right? If you got a dot outside that that boundary, unpredictable. Go go after whatever caused that dot or dots. If everything is within those boundaries, your process is predictable. May not be what you like, may not be what you want, but your process is predictable. And if you want to make a change, that's going to cause, uh, you're going to need a, a fundamental change to the system. Okay. So here's where we get in, believe it or not, here's where we get into the, the, the meat of the presentation. Because I want to talk about advice that is normally given that has nothing to do with separating out signal from noise. All up until, uh, until now, I've been talking about how do we separate out signal from noise, uh, but there's a lot of advice out there that talks about data analysis that has absolutely nothing to do with separating out signal from noise. Let's talk about outliers. I believe Malcolm Gladwell has written a book called Outliers. Is that correct? Again, I haven't read his stuff. I don't know. Um, but I think his book called Outliers, is, it's about like people, right? It's not about, it's not about data. Is it, is it, is it, I don't know. Some, somebody tell me. Is that true? Yeah. It's about people? Yeah, again, see, <laughs> if it's about people, you lost me. I, don't, I really don't care. Uh, the first thing that we, when we, when we hear the word outlier, unfortunately, we've been trained, our ear has been trained um, to, to understand the word outlier incorrectly. First thing we have to say is, what, what is an outlier? Hmm. Malcolm Gladwell would love you to believe that that dot right there, remember, this is the free throw percentage. Malcolm Gladwell would love to tell you that that point right there is an outlier. Remember, that's what, that's what caused Will Chamberlain to do so great. If we draw the boundaries around this process, that's not an outlier. Uh, but that one might be. We'll come back to that one uh, in a second. Um, another thing maybe you've been told o over the years is that whenever you have an extreme outlier like that, does anybody, can anybody suggest? What do you, like, when you have a complete extreme outlier, what are you supposed to do with those really, really extreme outliers? What are you supposed to do with those things? Exclude them. That's probably the absolute wrong thing to do because from Schuert's perspective, Schuert would say those extreme outliers, that's where all the signal is. If you exclude those outliers, you are purposefully eliminating signal, which is one of the worst things you can do. All right, this is the most controversial part of the, uh, of the presentation. I don't know. I don't know why it's controversial. I don't think it's controversial, but you guys tell me if it's controversial trends. Maybe you've heard this word trend before. If I throw, again, we, this is his free throw percentage per game, Will Chamberlain's free throw percentage per game, and I say the word trend, what do you see here? What, do you see a trend? Most people would say, yeah, look, in the middle there, it's, 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 it's trending upward. Right? But again, if we draw boundaries um, around that data, 
notice that all of that is well within the noise, right? Um, this is where the, uh, the title of the talk comes from. This is teen tobacco use in the United States. I believe it's just the United States. Uh, between 2011 and 2017, Anybody see a trend here? Now you're kind of gun shy, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but most people, I'll help you out. Most people would say, hey, look, teen tobacco use trending down over time. Look how wonderful this is, right? If we add in 2018, however, it goes back up. Somebody might, some people, not any of you, some people might say that, um, you know, uh, adding in 2018 data, uh, it trending it, uh, it, that it would, it's starting to trend back up. In fact, the USA Today said exactly that. There are no trends in noise. The best way so far that I found to explain this, and you tell me if this works or not, the best way that, I, that this idea of there's no trends in noise, let's say I have a fair six-sided die. And let's say I start rolling that, that six-sided die. And let's say first roll I get six, second roll I get five, third roll I get four, fourth roll I get three. Are those die rolls trending downward? All of those should be expected. All of those outcomes should be expected. Now, if I rolled a seven, <laughs> we should probably have a conversation, right? Um, but there, there's no such thing as a trend. The, the kind of uh, unintuitive thing about this, once, once you legitimately get a trend, uh, it's actual signal. It's not a trend anymore. It's signal that your process has changed. Unfortunately, we don't have time to get into that. I apologize. Um, I'm not getting invited back, so I don't know if I'll be able to get into that ever anyway. But uh, um, the, the, the kind of a, along this line is, and this is, this is where trends kind of really get you in trouble, potentially, is this idea of comparing a single point to an average. Because uh, what the USA Today further went on to say was, oh, well, the reason we know it's trending back up is because the long-term average of teen tobacco use was 16.2%. 2018 value was 18.3%. We have a value that's above average, so that means tobacco use is trending back up. Why does comparing a single point to a long-term average tell us absolutely nothing? Why do you think, it gives, honestly, it gives us no information whatsoever. Why, why do you think that is? Let me ask a simpler question. What is roughly our chances of having um, a, a single outcome be above or below average? Pretty close to 50%, right? If we want to be statistically rigorous, it's not actually quite that, but, but pretty close. We have a 50%, so I'm, I, have equal, I have equal chance of being, being right as, be, as to be not right. But what's even worse than that, again, as Shuart would say, is whether it's above or below the average is not what's important. It's how far above or how, be, how far below that average that we really care about. Um, but the USA Today isn't really telling us anything. And as we can see, if we plot this data, it's well within the noise. I come from Miami. Maybe some of you know that. I, don't, I wasn't born there. I just happen to live there right now. Um, we have these things called hurricanes that hit from time to time. This was the hurricane forecast for, uh, for this year. Experts predict above average 2022 hurricane season. This is from Forbes. Um, if anybody had to guess, how, how many hurricanes in, in the North and all of the North Atlantic, how many hurricanes do you think hit every year? Or form, I guess I should say form every year in the whole North Atlantic. 15 20, 15, 20, those are all good guesses. It's 14. Um, anybody know how many they, we've had this year? 11. Now, technically, the season's not over. For all intents and purposes, it is. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't end for another couple weeks, um, but 11. So do you see how this, this statement right here gives us absolutely no information whatsoever? I've got equal chance of being right or wrong, even if I'm right. Does that mean climate change is making hurricanes worse? Does that mean something else? Whatever, we, don't, we really don't know. Where have we seen this comparison before? Somebody was supposed to remember this. Where have we seen this comparison before? Basketball stats. Remember, this was the evidence that uh, Gladwell was, uh, was giving us that uh, Wilt Chamberlain uh, did, did something right. Um, this is just kind of fun for me because it's, it's kind of a pet peeve. I want to talk about histograms. Most everybody says, hey, when you have data, throw it in a histogram. How many people look at that? I don't know if anybody looks at their data in a histogram, especially time series data. Uh, this, is, this is real data from a team uh, that I work with. Uh, anybody who studied cycle time data would say, oh, yeah, look at this. This is, this is exactly what cycle time data is supposed to look like. It's log normal or Vibel or Vable or Weeble. I don't know what the, I don't know anybody know how to pronounce that, 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 
uh, that distribution. But look, this is, you know, you got a big hump on the left, you got a long tail out to the, out to the right. This is what our cycle time data is supposed to look like in a histogram. Let me ask you this. Is this team getting better or worse over time? Was there any change to the process at any point in time? I don't know either. Um, let's throw it in a scatter plot. I'm so glad that Julie explained what scatter plots are so I don't have to. Everybody was listening to Julia, right? Scatter plot. When was there a process change here? These are European dates, by the way. I think I made it European friendly. I did. Can everybody see across the bottom? When was the process change made? Yeah, when, when, yeah, around about the 1st of October. Right? This is why, and, and Julia always corrects me on this, this is why you never put time series data in a histogram. Because time is one of the biggest impacts of, uh, wh when the data was collected is one of the biggest context clues that we have uh, in terms of, of what's going on in our data. Right? If we have it like that, who knows? Right? So if we, we put these, oh, I, I didn't have, I usually have them side to side. Um, so never, 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 ever, ever fit your, uh, your uh, data to a probability distribution. That's the, the long story short. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Your process, well, let me say it a different way. A probability distribution did not generate your data. Your process did. Right? So I don't care, you know, this fancy mathematical whatever. We can talk about shape parameters and standard deviations. We were talking about standard deviations and stuff like that. None of that really matters. Um, but by the way, your, uh, your get out of jail free card, a couple of people have talked about this today. Uh, data have no meaning uh, apart from their context. Most people say context is king. I prefer context is queen. Um, Elizabeth will always be my monarch as far as I'm concerned. Not I necessarily can't have anything against Charles, right? But I just know, I just know, know Elizabeth. What does this mean? Let's go back to Wilt. So, um, did, did that change help? If I step off to the side here. The thing that Malcolm Gladwell got right is that 100 point game, possible signal, right? The fact that it was due to free throw percentages is dubious. In fact, having, done, having written a couple books and having done a lot of research, I, I'm very, very apprehensive of, of quoting Wikipedia. I don't necessarily recommend using Wikipedia as a, as a source for anything. Um, but if you go to the Wikipedia page on this, uh, uh, about this game, the actual story of what happened for me is uh, much, much, much more interesting. It's much more interesting. Had nothing to do with free throw uh, shooting, uh, by the way. Uh, Mr. Gladwell's mistaking noise for signal. All right. So what? If you care about, if you care about improvement, if you care about, con care about continual improvement, and you should, then you should be looking at your data uh, to find those opportunities for improvement. So if you've given a set of data, draw some boundaries around it, see if your process is predictable or not. If you have anything outside those boundaries, this is an approach, by the way. If you have anything outside those boundaries, uh, your process is, is probably not predictable. Once you make a change, how do you know that that change actually you know, resulted in what you wanted? You know, did, did it actually make our process predictable or not? Um, you know, and then... Well, what do we do if we have data like this and uh, we don't have anything outside of our um, outside of those boundaries? Well, now we have to make you know a fundamental system systemic change. Um, last but not least, you know, and this is why I think a lot of people get hung up on like the, the process behavior charts and how you draw them. You may not even need something like a process behavior chart. Pretty obvious right here, right? That there was a change that was made and it looks like things got better. Right? We may not even necessarily need a process behavior chart. What I really want you thinking about is that separating out noise for signal and how do we verify that those improvements um, resulted in what we wanted. Uh, special thanks to uh, my partner in crime. Uh, his name is Pratik Singh. I think Pratik's name was mentioned earlier. Um, we don't like to show pictures of Pratik. Um, which is why we show pictures of the only thing that he's really good for, um, and that is his dog, Nisha. So um, special thanks to Nisha. And then, of course, um, don't use story points. <laughs> this, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in more information, the SPC Press is Dr. Donald Wheeler's website. Please go and read everything you want to um, about any of this stuff. Thanks so much. Thank you.